the structure of the presentation. I want to first explain a little bit what enclave deliberation is. Then the experimental procedure of our experiment. And I'm actually trying to merge two papers. The first one is the one that I sent out here. There's also another one concentrating on equality and efficacy. And I will just uh, shortly tell about the results there. And then some provide some conclusions. Let's see that I will be on time. Now this is just a team, it's not me alone. It's, uh, we have three senior scholars, uh, Kaiser Herne and Maya Setala, and then we have some younger uh, postdoctoral and doctoral students. Enclave deliberation, it's uh, mostly known to people from Cass Sunstein. He uses it when he refers to political discussion among, among like-minded people. And uh, as people said, previous research shows that people actually tend to become more extreme as a result of uh, talking to like-minded people. These can, from a democratic point of view, be uh, negative, because uh, the group polarization, that is the big becoming more uh, extreme, but also another one is that there is an amplification of cognitive errors, something claims. That is, when you don't have anyone questioning you, your beliefs will actually be strengthened, and you might not learn, which is, of course, the goal of all democratic talk and uh, deliberative democratic talk in particular. But uh, we were very interested in this because all the experiments so far and the evidence so far is from social psychology. And to our knowledge, nobody else has actually combined the two. The idea of having a deliberative mini public, there are a lot of deliberative mini public in the world. Most no widely known, of course, is the deliberative polling by Jim Fishkin and Bob Luskin, but also many others. Uh, and then combining that with the idea of having like-minded people, because these deliberative mini-publics always convene people with different uh, points of view. I already touched this a little bit. Because there are no opposing arguments, it's the idea in like-minded uh, deliberation or enclave deliberation. People are not motivated to reflect on their preferences and beliefs, so they will actually get confirmed. Also, that is of course moving a little bit to minority position already. Some people want to conform their uh, opinions. Uh, you know Elizabeth Neumann's uh, spiral of silence hypothesis. So they want to actually strengthen their in-group identity that might happen in these like-minded uh, groups. <clears throat> there are a variety of definitions of deliberation. Uh, the, maybe the most narrow one is by Habermas, where it's all, only communication based on the merits of arguments. But normally, nowadays, you can talk about a more wider uh, definition like J. Manfredi's, that it is communication inducing reflection on preferences, values, and interests in a non-coercive fashion. That, of course, would come rather close to any kind of democratic definition already. So uh, this is not so much about what kind of deliberation they were involved in. We can do that because we have taped all the group discussions, we have transcribed them, and we, can, we have already some data. But today's talk is not about that, just to give you, maybe some of you are not that familiar with deliberate democracy. So why would we think that there will be a different result from uh, people engaging in a deliberate mini-public, even if they speak to like-minded people, than the uh, earlier um, experiments from social psychology. Well, we think that because these are forums that are uh, designed to enhance reflection and uh, open-mindedness. So it might actually have an impact. So all the uh, results from many publics so far, but we have to bear in mind that all of them have been trying to, to um, gather different points of view in the same small end group. But they are very different from, from uh, the enclave deliberation uh, studies from social psychology, but with no norms to follow. Deliberate mini publics typically find that when people come together, they will come closer to each other because they are, they are a variety, there is a variety of viewpoints to start with, and people learn. This is well documented. So the difference is, as I said, uh, are made mainly based on the fact that these mini-publics guarantee it's always the recruitment process 
in a typical media public, that people have different views on the issue they are going to discuss on. There's also an information package provided in these mini publics. So that is like some kind of a leaflet, normally also sometimes a, an expert telling people about the subject at hand. There's always a moderator or facilitator in these groups, and they have specified rules for discussion. This setup encourages reflection. What we did is that we combined the idea of having like-minded people in a deliberate mini public. And um, this was an experiment, population-based experiment, so recruitment was a si uh, sim single, simple random sample. We had uh, discussion norms that were written, and they uh, emphasized respect for other people in the group, open-mindedness, reflection, also saying that nobody is right or wrong. We wanted to see what the consequences of deliberation in like-minded groups is on opinions, knowledge, and behavior. In order to do that, we wanted to compare delibera deliberation in like-minded groups, which will be the enclave treatment, with uh, mixed groups, which is the standard deliberative mini -public. So we manipulated, that's the treatment in the experiment. Some groups were like-minded, some were mixed. Of course, the subjects didn't know about this. Some of them understood. We heard that people were saying, why do we all agree on this? What's wrong? <laughs> so people are not stupid. And the topic was immigration. Finland is not a very multicultural country, uh, but still we have about 5 or 6% uh, immigrants, and it's a very uh, topical issue in Finnish politics, uh, immigration, especially because of the true Finns, which you might know, uh, won 19% of the vote uh, in the parliamentary election of 2011. This was a typical pre-test, post-test experiment. So we wanted to measure what happens when they, these people are in uh, groups with a lot of surveys. Uh, we also had a control group. Just to give you an idea of when it happened and how it happened, <coughs> it started in January 2012. There was a, first a short survey to form the enclaves that we call. So we, we formed a pro-enclave, which is the uh, pr a liberal enclave for immigration and the corn enclave which is against more immigration based on 14 items which I include also in the paper this was just to minimize uh, coding costs because you all know that if you survey a lot of people then you have to code them so we actually want to just uh, measure their opinions they didn't even know about the experiment at that time then we sent a second survey with a preliminary invitation to a discussion on the topic to some people. I will show you how it was. Then the event itself, it was a one-day event for every participant, so either a Saturday or Sunday. There was a short quiz measuring their knowledge, political knowledge and issue knowledge on immigration, uh, instructions and briefing on the immigration issue, and then the small group discussions or deliberations, which were only four hours, and there was also a lunch break. So this was not a very long time. But all of us know who work with people that people will get tired at some point. You cannot have them. You could have them for two days, but that uh, adds the cost. And they, oh, of course, they might then uh, socialize themselves between groups, <laughs> between three groups. Uh, the day ended with a survey, the post survey. Then we had a debriefing because we were aware, afraid of creating some kind of especially anti-immigrant monsters, if you like, <laughs> because we were uh, having them in these enclaves. We didn't want to do that as social scientists. I think that's something that's actually often overlooked in experiments, especially in experiments uh, in the US on different kinds of election things, these canvassing experiments. I think it's, there's too little discussion on that, but that's another topic. And there was also a follow-up survey at this debriefing. We framed it as a cocktail, so people actually showed up and they also, also got the 90 euro voucher, which was the reward for participation. But it was really nice to see those people you know, dressing up, coming to a cocktail, and they were... <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, and also, when we told, or I told them about what we had measured, and so they were so quiet, the whole auditorium of people. So actually, they were really concentrating. That's a contrast to all the students when you try to pay <laughs> 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 <But then, laughs> yes. So the first uh, survey was sent to a random sample of 12,000 adults, and uh, almost 40% responded. That was quite high, I think, but it has to do with the fact that there were only 40, 14 items to 
function. We uh, formed the enclaves based on this initial survey. The sur initial survey was pilot tested at two universities and it also worked fine. It also only forms one factor in factor uh, analysis, so it measures really one dimensional uh, attitudes towards immigration. And these are the enclaves I already told you. The pro, we use that all the time. The pro is the liberals and the con is the anti-immigrant. This is how it looked on the 14 item scale. The zero on the, uh, at, the at the very bottom of the x-axis is um, uh, the total anti-immigrant attitude. These are persons. This is a frequency of, of all the, um, all the 3,232 responded. And uh, the 14 is the totally pro-immigration person. So it's pretty normally distributed. Not perfectly, but what is in social sciences. Then we did uh, a trick. We wanted to get rid of some people in the middle, the ones who were not clearly anti or pro, because we wanted to create the enclaves of like-minded people. So these were excluded. So now we have two trails. Now our, our re um, referees, um, and I'll re uh, revise and resubmit that the journal, um, have questioned this a little bit. But this is always a thing when you conduct empirical analysis. Should you have done a wider or not? But when you see the frequencies, then maybe you could get got rid of, but then you don't have enough people at the end. <laughs> there aren't very many there, so. It was a trade-off um, also within the group. This is how we ended up with 207 participants in the end, from 12,000 surveys. Uh, yeah, the actually 4,681 completed the survey, but all of them didn't allow further contact. And in Finland, it's very strict. You cannot contact people if they don't agree to that. So it's 3,232 uh, 3, who allowed further contact. We <coughs> excluded the 600 plus in the middle. Then we invited preliminaries 2,600 people with a more thorough survey, you know, all the background variables and political behavior, uh, values, and so on. Then we got 805 responses to that. And uh, these were also volunteers to take part in the discussion, as it was called. And at this point, we had no uh, doubts about the division. It was nicely evenly split. 415 against immigration, 390 in favor. Then we invited 183 randomly selected from each uh, enclave. And look what happened. The anti-immigrants didn't want to turn up. So this is a very in important learning to all of us, that some people with maybe not so politically correct attitudes might not be willing to come to talk about this issue. So that has to be ta 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 taken into consideration when designing this kind of Endeavors. This is um, day one, people waiting to be instructed. Now, uh, the fact that so many more pro immigration people um, volunteered created the problem because the mixed groups, the standard deliberately mini public, has to guarantee that there are equally uh, equ an equal amount of participants in each small end group. So, this has to be the same. So this creates a bias in the pro-like-minded uh, cell here. And these are, of course, we would have more, wanted more of these anti-immigrants, especially when we look at the results now. So it would have been very nice. But that's one tricky thing with experiments, that you cannot change anything afterwards. So you have to yeah, plan everything carefully. And all the comments at conferences so far, also the referees think that this was very a carefully designed experiment, but some things happen that you cannot anticipate. It's just a, one of the smaller deliberations. The first paper that was distributed here concentrates on opinion change and knowledge uh, gains. And we thought, based on earlier literature, that uh, the enclave treatment or the like minded treatment would lead to a polarization of opinions. This is, of course, a little rather funny because it's a unipolar, not a bipolar. More extreme. But of course, at the end, it will be also a bipolar if the two groups then come together, having moved to extremes. 
We thought so. And in mixed groups, as previous research shows, uh, depolarization coming together. We also thought that, as some skin suggests, that uh, people will not learn, will actually might even become less knowledgeable in these like-minded groups, and people will, be, will get more knowledge uh, in the mixed groups. But then we thought that maybe the deliberative norms will interfere a little bit with previous uh, results. What we found out is that everybody became more tolerant. Uh, first, the common like-minded. So this is still the sum variable from 0 to 14. They started with uh, an average of 5.1 on this 14 item scale. Uh, after deliberation in the like-minded groups, they had become uh, uh, more tolerant. 5.7 is the mean, and it's statistically significant. And what is even more interesting is that after between after and follow-up, they also became more tolerant. So this is also a statistically significant change. So the anti-immigrants became, in the like-minded treatment, more tolerant. Of course, the mixed, the anti-immigrants in the mixed treatment, you can see an even uh, larger um, shift towards um, more liberal at, uh, attitudes. But they didn't. This is not anymore. So they happened nothing after deliberation. This is unfortunate. This is also because it was a random assignment. This is a randomized trial. So for some reason, these people were a little bit more um, intolerant to start with. You kind of change that when you have a randomized uh, into groups. Unfortunate. But, um, you should have a, a larger N in order to avoid that. Then the pro-like-minded, they actually became also more tolerant. This is the only group that acted according to our hypothesis. So the liberals, in with liberals, became a little bit more tolerant. Uh, as also Sunstein says, that it doesn't only have to be conservative attitudes or anti-attitudes or something. It can also be liberal attitudes that are, that are strengthened. Whereas the pro-mix didn't depolarize, that is, they didn't come closer to this. There is no significant. So we have mixed results, but mainly a fact saying that, okay, people become, the con people became more tolerant, no matter in which treatment they were in. What is also interesting is that if you look at people, here I have classified participants according to which side they belong to. So after the deliberation, many con participants were, in fact, in favor of non immigration, which is quite interesting. So you see that also in the like-minded treatment, six anti-immigrants had actually changed sides. So they had become liberal. And there are 14 of those people in the mixed treatment. But if you look at the follow-up survey, which was at the debriefing, the reflection that could be seen in the like-minded treatment has actually produced 11 uh, shifters from anti to pro which is quite interesting, we think. What about knowledge? Everybody learned, and the learning curves are very similar. This is the starting point, what people knew. This is uh, like a percent share on 10 items. So. After the deliberation day, learning curves were very similar. Of course, there are some minor differences, but they are not statistically significant. What do we conclude? As I already said, uh, in the like-minded groups, polarization only occurred to some extent in the pro-enclave, the liberal enclave. Groups in the con-enclave became more permissive, which was a surprise. We can see no amplification of cognitive errors in either enclave when you look at that. When we look at the mixed groups, depolarization only in the Conan clay, the pro people did not become closer uh, uh, the anti immigrants And we see a similar learning curve. We also have some individual level analysis in the paper. And uh, we find out that people who feel that people with opposite viewpoints may have a good arguments for their opinions, change their opinions more, which is 
maybe a proxy for a deliberative attitude or, or open-mindedness. Then we also asked if, if you felt that somebody dominated the discussion. So people tend, who, were, uh, who perceived that other participants dominated tended to be less permissive, especially in the con like mine. We also had some immigrants. We did not somehow control that. There were some immigrants in the smaller groups. So if there was an immigrant present, it increased positive opinion change at the individual level. Then uh, just briefly, I, I think I'm running out of time, on equality and efficacy. Uh, this is another paper, and it's in a way interesting because there is a lot of literature saying that these like-minded groups can actually be good for political action. Political action theorists might claim that it's good to be with your peers before entering the wide arena. So we looked at um, discussion equality, that is how much people discussed in these groups, and whether they preserved uh, that the discussion was equal. And also both external and internal efficacy. I will not go through this, it's just basically reflecting socioeconomic uh, status in relation to uh, political action, you all know that you work with elections. <laughs> but there is uh, a lot of literature saying that people actually, politically weaker groups, need safe spaces in order to actually be politically active. So we wanted to test that. Um, you can see, this is just a background information that you see that people who were against immigration have a much lower external efficacy. This is pre-deliberation to start with. So they are somehow alienated from the political sphere. Another thing in this one is that people in the mixed groups talk much more. So that's somehow showing that like-minded people don't need to <laughs> talk as long. So 70.8 speech act uh, uh, on average in the mixed treatment compared to 50 speech act in the life of treatment. I won't go into details here, I'll just show you the results. Um, this is of course something that you can never get rid of. If you look at the amount of talk, this is the resource variable based on gender, age, education, previous political action and uh, <coughs> political discussion. You see that those who have the highest resources on this variable are also the most frequent speakers in these groups. There is, however, no differences, no linear difference when it comes to perceived inequality. So people who talk less don't feel that they have been uh, inequally treated. This just shows that um, also people with low resources talked much more in the mixed treatment than in the like-minded treatment, but you see that these resourceful people really dominate discussions, also in this setting where you have rules and you have a moderator trying to see to it that nobody dominates. I will go through this now very fast. We had no efficacy changes. So neither internal nor external uh, increase. Conclusions from the paper two is from paper two is that deliberation in these like-minded groups did not have the anticipated boost effects on participants with lower resources, as literature would suggest. On the contrary, all participants were more active in the mixture. Perceived inequality was not higher in the mixed treatment for any group of participants. And unfortunately, old SCS patterns prevail in deliberation equality. That is something that we have to think about if we are going to design these kind of forums, no matter what. So what should we say about our experiment and the two papers? Well, we feel that organized deliberation is different from other uh, forms of political talk. If you give uh, participants some norms to follow, they will actually uh, change their minds in a different way than earlier uh, research shows. People with anti-immigrant attitudes became more tolerant, also in the like-minded groups. Michael Neblo has talked about progressive vanguardianism. 
not good in the sense that uh, all opinions or arguments based on opinion should not be uh, treated at the same way. They, they should be laundered if they are based, for instance, on prejudice, which might be the case on immigration. So you might say that um, this is a, a nice finding. And this is my last slide. So when it comes to the other paper, we did not find the uh, activity or efficacy changes for participants, lower resources, in the like-minded treatment. We must, however, remember that this might be a fact of the, uh, or, or a result of the fact that these people must not always have understood that they were in the like-minded, in an enclave. Because normally enclaves on the internet, for instance, you know that you are entering the like-minded. So, of course, this reservation must be made. People also wanted to know that what does this mean in terms of <laughs> uh, deeply divided societies? Well, maybe not in, uh, in Ukraine at the moment, but I mean, there's, I think that there's some hope. Because if, if our results hold, we are actually, of course, in need of uh, creating more external validity. Now, this is one experiment, so uh, we need to do that. That's also very interesting that always with experimental papers you get that comment, but when you work with survey research you don't really get that comment. <laughs> but it's, well, anyway. Uh, we think that it can actually be useful to try to enforce deliberative norms in deeply divided societies. And also let them, these people talk with each other first. It might actually increase their tolerance of the other I mean, this has been done in Northern Ireland, and, and, um, but I mean, it might not be possible if there is a real armed conflict going on. But, but at some point, I think that this is um, possible. So we are going to continue with that. We are, go we are now uh, designing a new experiment where we have a little bit different setup, but we are trying to uh, revalidate our results. Thank you. Thank you.